Wife is a slave. Don't slack off on housework. Pregnant with a big belly at nine months, I was pushed away by my husband, Alfred, without hesitation. It seems he's displeased with me for resting too much and not doing household chores because of my impending early delivery. I don't expect kindness from him, and I'm used to being scolded. But today, Alfred's eyes were different. Instead of enjoying harassing me, he seemed to be projecting his great anxieties. Ah, just give me alcohol. Alcohol. Alfred drank voraciously, spilling liquor from the corner of his mouth. Quickly getting drunk, he fell asleep in the living room, snoring loudly. It appears I'm a slave named daughter-in-law, so I cleaned up the empty cans and covered Alfred with a blanket so he wouldn't catch a cold. Running to alcohol, how uncool. I looked down at him and quietly raised the corners of my mouth. The next morning, claiming to have caught a cold and skipping work, Alfred crawled back into bed. But I didn't let it slide. Thanks to Alfred, I can live comfortably. I always appreciate it. I patted his back, which unusually lacked confidence. A husband's duty is to earn money. Off you go to work. Who knows what will happen there? I'm Mina Jaeger, 23 years old. I married Alfred, who is 12 years my senior, six months ago. Yeah, that's good. Alfred nodded contently after tasting the meal. Relieved, I let out a sigh. That's how he always praises me. Coming home tired to a tidy room, delicious food, and a beautiful Mina waiting, I'm the happiest man. I carefully do the housework so that he, who is busy, can relax a bit. It feels good to be appreciated. Mina, you're also lucky to have me as your husband, to have such an elegant wife at that age. Alfred, older than me, is dependable and always leads me. We met at a career fair while I was job hunting. Instead of getting a job, I ended up marrying him. My friends are working hard at their new jobs, so it's true that as a housewife, I live a more elegant life. He specifies the number of dishes for meals and insists on sorting laundry by color and pattern. I also attend cooking classes at Alfred's suggestion, so I don't have much spare time, but it's rewarding because Alfred acknowledges me with a smile. Ah, this meat is so good, the best. It was expensive, right? You should thank me. Alfred has always been good at studying and now works for a top-tier company. Well, I am what you'd call an elite, Alfred had said before. His slightly condescending tone brimming with confidence seemed cool. And now a new life is growing inside me. I believed our home would become even happier. The distortion began around the third month of my pregnancy. One, two, three? Only three dishes? That's odd. Am I so tired that I'm seeing this? Alfred counted the dishes in an exaggerated manner. I'm sorry, I haven't been feeling well. Hmm, and? And I've started having morning sickness. I can't move as I want to, and the smell of food makes it hard to cook. Alfred listened to my story without moving a brow. I wanted him to understand my pain, but it felt like I was just making excuses. Ah, I see, he said, nodding slightly. Imagine this, Mina. We go to a restaurant. The chef says, sorry, I'm not feeling well, and only serves an appetizer. Is that acceptable? I shook my head slightly. Next, we go to a play. The leading actor says, sorry, I'm not feeling well, lies on stage without makeup, and doesn't act. Is that acceptable? I looked down and shook my head again. Right, it's not. That's negligence of duty. If I were a customer, I'd be furious. But what you're doing now, Mina, is just that. Alfred peered into my face, deeply bowed. Am I supposed to take care of Mina like a pet? If a housewife doesn't do housework, what's her worth? You're just planning to leech off me, aren't you? I'm sorry. My voice was barely audible as I apologized again. How ugly. Imagine how I feel, having a gloomy wife like you in front of me. And why are your lips blue? Can't you at least put on lipstick? Makeup is a woman's manners. Even as a housewife disconnected from the outside world, don't neglect that. I'm sorry. I don't know how to make him understand the pain of morning sickness. I was just managing not to vomit, with no energy to argue. All I could do was apologize. After this, Alfred changed. When he returned from work, he would sigh heavily. Wow, did you even put on makeup? Yes, maybe it's a bit light. Hmm, so your ugliness seeps through, even with makeup. You look like a tired old hag, even though you're still young. Alfred ran his finger over a shelf, blowing away the dust. Then, soon after starting his meal, he frowned, setting down his knife and fork. Tasteless. Eating while looking at your sad face makes even the finest cuisine unpalatable. 
I'd rather eat at a deli. It's a hundred times better. With that, Alfred left the house. The meal I prepared while fighting nausea was left almost untouched. Gradually, Alfred's return home shifted to late at night. He didn't want to see my ugly face, nor eat my tasteless cooking. Morning sickness means you can just laze around all day. Pregnant women are lucky. Well, I'm grateful to have to eat out because our home is so uncomfortable now, Alfred said. This wasn't the happiness I had envisioned. No matter how late it was, I always greeted Alfred when he came home. That was all I could do, so I did it desperately. Alfred wouldn't even touch my slightly swollen belly. Instead, he avoided me with a look of disgust. Welcome home. There was no reply, just a click of the tongue. He swiftly passed by, his scent provoking a strong wave of nausea. When cleaning his clothes, I tried to hold my breath. The smell was unbearably bad. I never minded Alfred's smell before. Is it the pregnancy? No, it's not just that. I picked up his suit, grimacing at the scent. From the pocket of the discarded suit, I pulled out receipts, coins, and crumpled tissues. I smoothed out the crumpled receipt. Alfred had said that deli food was better than mine, but this was a receipt from a casual French restaurant. For two? Who did he take to such a fancy place? The reliable Alfred I loved was gone, I realized. The suit carried a sweet perfume scent. I couldn't help but notice the shadow of another woman. But for the sake of me and the baby, I needed Alfred. I crumpled the receipt again. It's my fault for being cheated on. I'm the one with a gloomy face, unable to properly do housework. After giving birth, I'll be free from morning sickness and my heavy body, and I can return to my housework. And with a cute baby, Alfred's heart will surely come back to me. I just have to endure this for now. Sunday morning, Alfred woke up leisurely. Since he sat at the breakfast table for the first time in a while, I prepared breakfast. I smiled a little and handed him a plate, but he grimaced. Ugh, look at yourself in the mirror. I had already done my makeup and changed clothes. I thought maybe my mascara had smudged, but that wasn't it. No, you've gained weight, not just your face. Your whole body shape has changed too much. <laughs> my face instantly heated up. I don't usually talk back, but this time I couldn't help it. It's because the baby in my belly is growing. No, it's not just the belly. Your whole body has become sloppy. Your backside seems to sag and your back is round. Give me a break. Your only asset was your youth, but looking like an old hag ruins that. Alfred sighed and lazily drank his coffee. Where did my young cute Mina go? Alfred scrutinized me from head to toe. Do you know why I married you, Mina? Because you were young and cute. That's it. And you were obedient and domestic. The perfect wife. But what about now? You don't do housework and you've let yourself go. It's like fraud. I opened my mouth, but no voice came out. Alfred, becoming more emboldened, berated me further. Youth fades away, and I regret choosing something so fleeting. I thought Mina, who respected me, was cute at first, but I guess independence was also necessary. I once wanted to be employed and independent, but it was Alfred who strongly opposed it. You don't need to work, just marry me. At work, there are people who take maternity and parental leave. They don't whine about morning sickness, they work normally. And recently, a single mother joined. Impressive, huh? Raising a child alone. That's what being a working adult is. Understand? As he spoke, nausea overwhelmed me. Unable to hold back, I rushed to the bathroom. His words pierced my back as I left. Ugh, running away. Must be nice not having responsibilities as a housewife. No matter how much I vomited, the sickness didn't subside. Eventually, Alfred stood behind me. Seeing me crying and suffering, he just scoffed. Disgusting. Without Alfred, my unborn child and I couldn't survive. I had to endure. I repeated this to myself over and over. My tears wouldn't stop. Underestimating me, Alfred's attitude worsened by the day. Late night returns were still better than his repeated overnight stays without contact. Yet he'd say, even if I might not eat it, you should prepare my meal. I work hard and wear myself out at work. Don't slack off on your simple housewife duties. On such days, he'd still leave restaurant receipts for two in his suit pocket. Enjoying lovely dinners with someone else and then coming home to torment me was insane. But I couldn't live without Alfred. I chanted this unconsciously, but stopped as my belly tightened. Soon, the pain eased, and I felt a push from inside. The first kick. I, too, am becoming a parent to this child. I can't just rely on Alfred. It was the moment I felt parental responsibility. But working and becoming independent during pregnancy was difficult. 
I did housework without upsetting Alfred and took care of him when he returned, saying, Welcome back from work. With my morning sickness easing, I could manage more housework. Please enjoy your meal. Hmm, you actually made food? As a wife, that's expected. But you must be lazing around during the day. I'm working so hard. Ah, how I envy you. I wish I could be pregnant, too. Thank you for everything, I said, eyes downcast. Alfred looked down at me with satisfaction. Although he still seemed to enjoy himself outside, things were superficially peaceful. But this peace didn't last long. I developed a condition that threatened preterm labor. I avoided hospitalization, but had to rest at home, unable to even do minimal housework. I just lay there, passing my days looking at my phone or tablet. Fortunately, Alfred rarely came home, which was a relief. I even thought it was better that he didn't care about me and just enjoyed himself. However, when he did come home occasionally, he would berate me terribly. You're sleeping again? A woman who just sleeps all the time being a wife. I really drew the short straw. Just eating and sleeping? You're no different from a cow. Strange. Did I marry a cow? No matter how much he insulted me, the fact that I was just sleeping made me apologize with a sorry. If I stayed quiet, Alfred would be satisfied. But one day, that suddenly changed. It was the final day of my ninth month of pregnancy. The next day, I would reach full term and the bed rest would finally be lifted. Alfred, who unusually came home in the evening, started yelling at me as soon as he saw my face. I quickly hid the tablet I was holding in the cushion. You're slacking off again. I'm working hard outside. Ugh, it's so frustrating. He threw his bag on the floor. Startled by his yelling and the loud noise, I shrank back. Grabbing my chest, Alfred accused me. Who do you think enables you to live? I'm not working to feed a lazy person like you. I'm sorry. Thank you for everything. I managed to say with a trembling voice. What's your job? Housework? Right? Why are you sleeping? You should work properly, too. Seeing you slacking off irritates me. I'm sorry. I didn't expect any kindness from Alfred and was used to being scolded. But today's Alfred seemed different. Instead of enjoying harassing me, he appeared to be projecting his great anxieties. He looked like he was just bluffing. Don't be so spoiled. Think about your position. I was pushed to the floor. Pointing at me, he shouted, Wives are slaves. Don't slack off on housework. Unable to contain his anger, Alfred punched the wall several times. Ah, uh, just give me alcohol, alcohol. From the corner of his mouth, Alfred drank heavily. Soon he was snoring loudly in the living room, apparently drunk quickly. Since I'm supposedly a slave named wife, I cleaned up the empty cans and covered Alfred with a blanket to prevent him from catching a cold. Running to alcohol, how uncool. Looking down at him, I quietly raised the corners of my mouth. The next morning, I woke up Alfred in time for work, but he just drank a glass of water and went back to the bedroom. Hey, Alfred, aren't you going to work? When I asked softly, Alfred just groaned. Alfred is usually good with alcohol, and last night he seemed to have fallen asleep without drinking much. He didn't look too sick for a hangover. I'm taking a day off, he mumbled into the blanket. I quickly checked his neck for a fever. No fever, huh? Shut up. I have a cold. My throat and head hurt. I'm going to have a fever soon. He shrugged off my hand and covered his head with the blanket. Okay, I'll make oatmeal then. If my husband claims to have a cold, it's my duty as a wife to make oatmeal. I quickly prepared it and offered it to Alfred. Eat this, then go to work. What? I said I'm taking the day off. He replied energetically. No, you can't. Faced with my smiling self, Alfred frowned frozen. Last night, I cleaned up the living room he had messed up, being mindful of my health. Though feeling heavy, I was working as a wife so I wouldn't allow Alfred to skip work. I do the housework Alfred works. Thanks to you, I can live. I always appreciate it. Alfred fell silent, looking puzzled. I patted his back, which seemed to lack his usual confidence. A husband's duty is to earn money. Then I forced him to get ready and headed to the station, pushing him onto the train. I held onto his arm to make sure we didn't get separated. Come on, we need to hurry so you're not late. What? Why are you even coming with me? You said you're feeling bad, right? I'm worried, so I'll come too. Plus, I'll do some shopping near your office. Don't mind me. I intended to make sure Alfred didn't skip work and pretend to go to the office. I'm not feeling bad anymore. You can get off the train. That's good to hear, but I said I'm going shopping, right? Why go so far? You can shop near home. In the crowd, Alfred seemed too drained to yell. 
Making unnecessary detours and walking slowly, he seemed off. Despite his futile resistance, we arrived at his office. We were a bit past the start of the workday. Worried about Alfred's tardiness, a man came out to greet him at the company. Hey, Jaeger, you're late. Executive hours, huh? The man was older than Alfred. Alfred was completely cowed. The man's mouth smiled, but his eyes were sharp and intimidating. Once caught by those powerful eyes, there seemed no escape. He firmly grabbed Alfred's arm as he tried to back away. Get inside, quickly. Alfred looked terrified, as if being dragged into a den of beasts. Seeking help, he reached out to me. M Mina. Please work hard, I smiled kindly. Alfred was shaking, unsettled. Mrs. Jaeger, right? Thank you for bringing Jaeger here. We have an important discussion. Would you like to join us? Yes, of course. In the conference room, Alfred tried to make himself as small as possible in a pipe chair. The man introduced himself as Alfred's direct supervisor. There was also an older man showing clear anger. And a sulking woman. Jaeger, anything to say? The supervisor asked in a low voice. Alfred looked down in silence. If Jaeger won't speak, let's talk about what we know. Despite having a family, you've been quite close with Miss Simmons from your department. Miss Simmons was the sulking woman. The company doesn't usually reprimand an employee's affair. But first, how about apologizing to Mrs. Jaeger? Alfred glanced at me, biting his lip. With pride as high as Everest, Alfred couldn't possibly apologize. Uh, an affair? What are you talking about? I have no idea. It must be a misunderstanding. <laughs> Alfred's voice was barely audible, trying to defend himself. No one believed his words. Then look at this. I presented several photos. Pictures of Alfred and Miss Simmons intimately close. What? Alfred was astonished. Looking back and forth between me and the photos, he seemed to ask how, making me almost laugh. Yesterday, everyone at work found out about your affair, right? You came home like you were fleeing. I wondered what you'd do the next day and beyond. How long were you planning to skip work with that childish lie about catching a cold? Alfred's eyes widened so much they looked like they might fall out. I was the one who reported your affair to the company. Alfred was speechless, opening and closing his mouth like a fish. Alfred was hardly ever home, and I couldn't get out of bed even if I wanted to. So I had plenty of time to sneak a look at his tablet. It took some effort to crack the password, but it turned out to be his birthday. Typical of self-loving Alfred. The tablet, synced with his mobile phone, had unlimited access to photos and messages. Completely underestimated by Alfred, I was getting the better of him, his face turning red. He spat at me, not caring that we were at his workplace. Are you kidding me? You involved the company over a mere affair? I just reported it since the other party seemed to be a colleague. And you think you'll get away with this? Now that the affair is out, I'll face a pay cut or demotion. You realize that means less income, right? Even you'll be in trouble, especially with a baby on the way. Using the child as leverage now, when he never showed interest, was despicable. But I remained calm. I acted precisely because the baby is coming soon. Wives are slaves, right? I can't imagine this moral harassment stopping once the baby is born. I don't want to raise a child in a home where it's normal for the mother to be abused. No chance a moral harasser and cheater like Alfred will change and become a good dad. We don't need a dad who's a detriment. I want a divorce before the baby is born. Alfred, rejected by a wife, no, a slave, was frozen again. I always thought Alfred was a confident and composed adult, but under pressure, he couldn't even make a decent excuse. The disparity from his usual cool demeanor was pathetic. It's only natural Mrs. Yeager would give up on you. Now let's have our discussion. An older man spoke up. I wasn't the only one unable to forgive Alfred's slump. Why is Mr. Simmons the COO involved? This is overkill. Alfred muttered with a tearful, bitter expression. Mr. Simmons, the COO, was expressing an unusual amount of anger for just an employee's affair scandal. You dare to mess with my daughter. What? Alfred exclaimed in shock. After looking around, Alfred realized, Ah, Simmons, wait, Miss Simmons' father? Yes, Mr. Simmons was the father of Alfred's affair partner. I couldn't just settle for a divorce. I reported the affair to the company. I thought Alfred deserved a pay cut or the cold shoulder from everyone. That was all I intended. But when I got Alfred's supervisor on the phone, even he sounded shaken. You're doing this with your wife in her final month of pregnancy? Mr. Simmons' angry voice echoed. With no choice but to respond, Alfred quickly apologized profusely. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. 
My daughter knew you were married and yet got involved with you. I'm deeply disappointed in her. Truly sorry for what she did to your wife. Miss Simmons, it turned out, was the single mother Alfred had once mentioned. Perhaps Alfred, fed up with me, a useless housewife, was drawn to her, managing both work and parenting. But in reality, Miss Simmons had given birth unmarried and left the child rearing to her mother while she went out. That's why Mr. Simmons had used his connections to get her a job, wanting to keep an eye on her. She was still somewhat neglectful of her child, but surprisingly, she attended work diligently, which had reassured Mr. Simmons. And to think, it was all for meeting Alfred. The thought was unbearable. I'm sorry. I've broken up with Miss Simmons. We're completely over. I'm so sorry. Alfred was just frantically apologizing. Yes, my daughter told me it's over. Mr. Simmons confirmed, gripping Alfred's head. How come scum like you with no value in passing down your genes always seem to have such strong reproductive capabilities? An apology won't cut it. You may have broken up, but your crime doesn't disappear. Uh, uh, my daughter was pregnant after all. Uh, uh, Alfred collapsed to the floor, as if his bones had turned to jelly. It's not true. There's no child. It's okay. His feeble denial only ignited Mr. Simmons' fury. Of course not, because you persuaded my daughter to have an abortion. Sorry, sorry. Alfred, receiving Mr. Simmons' punch, cried out for mercy. Even as Alfred looked up for help, Mr. Simmons was completely enraged, with the supervisor and Miss Simmons turning away. Miss Simmons had wanted to have a child with Alfred and marry him, but after being forced to abort, she came to despise him. Miss Simmons was selfish for having an affair, but Alfred, who toyed with her, was the worst. Only I met his gaze and Alfred accused me. Mina, it's cruel, too cruel. Yeah, it is cruel. Alfred is. Having accomplished my purpose, I left the conference room. Stepping into the corridor, the onlookers scattered. Seems like there had been rubberneckers. There's probably no place for Alfred in the company anymore. Alfred's screams echoed from the conference room. After that, Alfred and I divorced. I always thought about divorcing you. I just pitied you and endured. Pretending to be strong until the end, Alfred was easily divorced. And the company's decision was to fire him. He was expecting a pay cut or demotion, but the punishment was more severe. A normal person might resign after such rumors spread, but prideful Alfred clung to the top-tier company. He struggled to accept the dismissal, protesting vehemently. Actually, I had submitted various evidence to the company. Frequent messaging during work hours was just the start. Claiming to be on outside appointments, but frequently resting in hotels. Even worse, he charged those expenses to the company. There was no room for defense. After splitting with Miss Simmons and losing his job, Alfred came back to me. Despite already being divorced, I wondered what face he would show up with. Once everything was taken from me, I realized what's important. I want Mina more than status or honor. Has our child been born yet? I want to meet my child. I heard that Alfred's parents were furious with his foolish actions and had disowned him. They had looked forward to embracing their grandchild only to have their hopes shattered. A jobless middle-aged son returning home certainly wasn't a joy. It's no surprise that he wasn't even allowed to enter his parents' house. Unable to rely on his parents, Alfred moved from his expensive apartment to a cheap one. His pride hindered his re-employment efforts. He had to pay compensation to both Miss Simmons and me due to the divorce proceedings, leaving his savings nearly depleted. I felt no sympathy. Lonely enough to seek out a slave like me, that's how alone he was. My child, what are you talking about? My child never had a dad from the start. Better to proudly say, there's no dad, than have such a man claim the title. Perhaps taken aback by my firm stance, Alfred left, deflated. I'm now living with my parents. When I decided to marry Alfred, they worried about my young marriage. I insisted it would be fine, which made it harder to confide in them about Alfred. But they seemed to have anticipated my feelings. When I finally broke down and confessed about the moral harassment and affair, they comforted me as if they had always known. It must have been hard for you. I delayed mentioning divorce because I wanted to gather evidence to secure an advantageous position. My parents must have been worried sick about leaving their pregnant daughter with an abusive husband. Yet, they respected my decision and watched over me. When I was immobilized due to the threat of premature labor, my mom would come to the apartment to clean and cook for me. I think I wouldn't have been able to escape from Alfred without my parents' help. I'm sorry for always causing trouble. Feeling guilty for failing in marriage and returning home with a child, I apologized. My mother smiled gently. 
You know, taking care of a baby is hard. Diapers leak, nights are sleepless, and babies always cause trouble. But I'm happy. As a mom, you understand, right? No matter how much trouble our own child causes, it's never a burden. Mom was feeding the baby milk. Her profile was so tender. I felt like I had reverted to a child myself. As I hugged her softly, she stroked my head with the same warmth she gave the baby. I had no idea what was going on at the time and spent a lot of time doubting my husband. This was almost 10 years ago. I was in my 30s and had only recently married my husband. With my husband working so hard even before we married, I expected life with him to be difficult. But he never came home for so long that I felt alone. At first, I tried to let my husband relax at home during the rare times he would be at home. But my frustration grew. I became harsh with him every time I saw his face. My husband would try to soothe me, but if he saw that I was still unsatisfied, he started to ignore me. I wanted him to look at me no matter how busy he was with his work, because we were married. This emotion got the best of me, and I couldn't look at my husband objectively any longer. Whenever I would pick a fight with my husband, he would always say, I'm going to settle down soon and then we'll go to that island you like. But this never came true. Work is more important than me, isn't it? I said. If so, don't force yourself to come home. I'm tired too, and seeing you so exhausted makes me sad. No matter how many horrible things I said to him, he never took it seriously. And I began to have a nagging feeling that our marriage was coming to an end. Soon after, my husband could tell I wasn't even mad at him and had no feelings for him. I didn't suspect it at first because he worked in a department with many business trips. But one day, I found a receipt and membership card for a hotel near our house in his suit pocket after he came home from a business trip. The receipt indicated that he had stayed at the hotel on the day when he was out of town on a business trip. And he had accumulated points for more than one night. As a successful businessman who could get the job done, my husband was quite popular with the ladies at work. I guess that he had found another woman to be with. Why should I have a hard time when he is enjoying being with another woman? I went out at night in spite of my husband's infidelity and made plans on the weekends too. It was fun for a while, but eventually I grew tired. I was tired of forcing myself to smile and not being able to truly enjoy myself. Perhaps it was finally time for my husband and I to be free. We're both avoiding each other, not facing each other as husband and wife. It would be preferable if my husband was happier with someone other than me. I suppose it's time for me to move on to the next chapter of my life. But this is the husband I used to love until I realized I didn't want to spend the rest of my life with him. It took a lot of guts for me to ask for a divorce. I also wondered if there was really no other option but to call it quits. But it seems that my husband has a new girlfriend. After days of deliberation, I made a decision and sent a text message to my husband's cell phone. Will you come home early today? I need to talk to you. I texted him on his cell phone. I need to talk to you too, and I'll try to leave as soon as possible. He replied right away. I found myself thinking that my husband must not want a divorce, even though I was certain I had made my decision. My husband is also seeking a divorce. Just thinking about it made my heart race so fast that I couldn't breathe and I struggled to stand. My husband's heart was not with me, it went to someone else. Let's not cry anymore. At the very least, I should end things with a smile. I made my decision and waited for my husband to return home. It was shortly after 9 p.m. when my husband returned home. He'd lost an unexpected amount of weight. His kind eyes and tone of voice remained the same, but there was a gap between us that seemed insurmountable. 
My husband, who had never been a man of many words, kept looking down and remained silent, except for a few words while I spoke. I wanted to end the conversation with my husband in a respectful manner because I felt he was making a lot of fun of me. We were a married couple, albeit for a short time, and we were about to divorce. So why wouldn't he tell me how he felt? I became increasingly angry and began to argue with him. However, my husband remained silent and listened to what I had to say. I wanted him to say something, so I told him that I knew about his new girlfriend. He probably thought I was oblivious to the fact. If he knew I knew everything, he would become impatient and make one excuse after another. Hearing my words, my husband looked at me in surprise, then smiled briefly. After a brief pause, he asked, "What you knew?" I said. Strangely, I couldn't help but laugh at his joking tone, which made my husband laugh. And for the first time in a long time, we laughed together. Regardless of the topic of the conversation, I was overjoyed to be able to laugh with my husband like we used to. We were able to talk again after that, which was a strange sensation. Perhaps it was because he found out I knew about the affair. My husband's face appeared to be revitalized. Let's stop attacking each other. I don't want to leave you because I don't like you," he said. My husband agreed to my proposal, and we decided to clean our room and share our belongings so that we could leave at any time. They were all precious memories, but they were all things I wanted to keep hidden for a while. My husband has always been the type of person who uses things he's had for years, but today he hadn't hesitated to throw them away. His grace overwhelmed me even more. Take anything you want; it's all my fault. So this is my atonement," he said when the room was clean and tidy, and we only had each other's belongings. My husband's eyes seemed to well up with tears as he said this. Did he feel sad as he cleaned up the mess? That was very clear to me because I felt the same way. You still have time to think about it, don't you? Let's clean up one step at a time. I decided to take a break for the rest of the day after cleaning up the entire mess. I took a bath to clear my mind. I should be able to get compensation from my unfaithful husband, but it was clear that our relationship had already ended. Besides, I don't want to taint my memories of my husband any further. As I was getting ready for bed after the bath, my husband entered the bedroom. He climbed into bed and gently drew me into his arms. "Hey, this is weird, and I feel bad for your girlfriend," I said. My husband said quietly. Just one more time, I want to be by your side. I stiffened slightly. He was trembling as he wrapped his arms around me. Are you crying? I asked him, but he didn't respond. I noticed that his body was lighter and more bony as I stroked his back. Are you sure you're well? You appear to have shed some pounds. When I said this to him, his body stopped shaking. I've been cutting weight, he said. Pulling his body away from mine, taking a deep breath. Okay, is there anything else I should know? Are you sure you're okay? It had been a long time since I had touched my husband's body, and I was surprised to see how different it looked from before. My husband's physique was always stocky and muscular. Even when he was busy, he enjoyed working out. But he told me, "She likes me like this." I was sad once more. He's doing it for her. Why doesn't he just forget about me if he enjoys being with her so much that he loses weight? I see. Then there's no need to cry because it's the last day, or is it tears of joy? To keep my sadness at bay, I said something sarcastic that I didn't need to say. You're still the same. I like that part of you too. I wish you a happy life from tomorrow. I'll be praying for you wherever you are. My husband said lightly. After saying that, my husband began to snore. He was a man who moved at his own pace until the end. I hope so as well. I fell asleep after murmuring to his sleeping face. I overslept the next day because I had stayed up late cleaning up the room the day before. My husband was no longer in bed when I awoke. When I entered the living room, I noticed an A4 size envelope on the table. And when I opened it, I discovered a bank book and a slew of documents inside. When I removed everything, I discovered that it was related to a marital property. 
There was also an unusually large sum of money in the bank book in my name, and I discovered the divorce papers in a small envelope. My husband's section had already been filled, so all that remained was for me to complete and submit mine. In a panic, I dialed my husband's cell phone, but it was disconnected because it appeared to have been cancelled. I spent several days asking about my husband's whereabouts with his parents and friends, but none of them would tell me. I had no choice but to contact his company, where I discovered that my husband, the workaholic, had resigned a few months before. It would have made sense if he made a new girlfriend and left, but why go to such length? Why didn't anyone tell me anything? I've grown suspicious of people, and there appears to be no way to contact my husband. The mental fatigue that had been building up since before the divorce nearly crushed me. My husband had gone to the trouble of arranging compensation for me, and now that I was free, I decided to spend some time in a place I really enjoyed. We arrived at the remote island, which took nearly a day to reach from the mainland. The island was depopulated, and about three thousand people lived there. I had visited the island once with my husband, and was captivated by its natural beauty and the slow flow of time. My husband promised that we would return to the island once his work was completed. I miss my husband, but maybe what I need now is the peace and quiet of that place. I quit my job and moved to this remote island a few months later after renting the house to someone else. It was a risky move on my part, but I knew I couldn't stay in my house any longer. I'm not sure how my husband paid off the mortgage, but I know he worked very hard. But there were too many memories to keep living alone in the house. However, I didn't want to waste my husband's efforts, so I didn't want to just let it go. There are many strange things, but I can't ask my husband about them anymore. I plan to spend time on this quiet island, relaxing and letting myself go. I began to adjust to island life and became acquainted with my neighbors. I had enough assets to live a normal life without working, but I realized that doing nothing was even more depressing. So I started working as a sort of helper, assisting the elderly neighbors with their problems. I was initially treated as an outsider, but as I became more used to the work, I was relieved to be accepted as one of the islanders. As I was settling in, I learned from a coworker that a new client had arrived from the main island for medical treatment. He had become ill and had chosen this island as his final residence, because there was no treatment available. Moving to this island with no medical facilities would be difficult, unless you are very prepared to move to this island in that condition. I was thinking that being in charge would be difficult when the new client asked for a visit, and I was the only one free. I had heard about his medical condition, so I was nervous as I went to his house. We arrived at the small house on a hill with a view of the ocean. The house had been vacant for a long time and had been renovated to the point where it was livable, but it was really just enough to keep the wind and rain out. I questioned whether this was the best place for him to spend his final days. With concern, I rang the doorbell. "Come in," a small voice said, barely audible. I gave my usual greeting and entered. I found my client sitting in front of a window, the sun and wind streaming in. I couldn't see his face because it was backlit, so I squinted as I approached. "It's a pleasure to meet you today, sir." As I looked at the face that I had turned to me, I was speechless. My husband, no, my ex-husband, sat there. We were both taken aback. We just stood there staring. My husband initiated the conversation. "You found me out," he said. He was mischievously smiling, like before. "What exactly are you doing here?" I was so confused by my husband's presence, the fact that he wasn't supposed to be there, as well as the information I had heard at work, that I couldn't speak properly. My husband grabbed my hand and forced me to sit next to him. He sat next to me and held my hand until I relaxed. I couldn't think of anything to say to him, and as I sat there, I heard a voice at the door. I wiped my tears and opened the door, where an elderly man stood. He seemed surprised to see my tear-stained face, but he bowed, 
went inside and sat down next to my husband. How are you doing today? He inquired. He spoke in a soft voice. My husband said that there was nothing unusual and began chatting with him. The elderly man was most likely the island's only doctor. I remembered my colleagues telling me that there were no inpatient facilities on the island, and that the clinic nurse and doctor were the island's lifelines. So it appears that my husband came to the island to spend his final days here. Although it was his decision, I listened intently to their conversation. I was wondering if there was anything I could do to help. My husband's doctor left after about ten minutes of casual conversation. I couldn't help myself and ran after him. I guess my flustered appearance startled him again, but when I told him of our relationship, he seemed to understand. I questioned the doctor about my husband's condition and future treatment, but he said, "I can't tell you without his consent." Maybe he felt sorry for me and said. He won't be able to walk by himself very soon. It seemed a shame for him to spend his final days alone, so please be there for him. I was stunned. What became of my husband's girlfriend? I returned back to the house with heavy steps, where my husband was waiting. My husband appeared to have anticipated my questioning the doctor, and greeted me with a smile. "You're back." I couldn't live without my husband, so I asked him to let me spend the night. My husband's house was only a few pieces of luggage and a couple of futons. It was the first time I'd slept with my husband since we discussed divorce. As I cuddled up under the covers with my husband, we told each other how we got here. I was eager to ask about his illness, but I decided that it wasn't time to talk about painful topics. So we reminisced. This was also due to my feelings about his relationship with her. I asked him if he hadn't brought her to the island before I asked to stay, but he just laughed and covered it up. The fact that he didn't say anything suggested that there was a sad event. I was careful not to hurt his feelings by asking any more questions. The next day, I informed my employer of what had occurred. And decided to take some time off. I want to spend what time my husband had with him. I took my husband, who couldn't walk very far, around the island in a wheelchair. There were places I remembered from my previous visit, places and scenery I wanted to show him for the first time. It was satisfying just being together. I wish we'd been this close when we were married. Even after my divorce, I discovered that the feelings I had grew stronger. But there is nothing I could do about it now. My husband would be confused if I told him. Like friends, I would stay by his side. The good times were fleeting, but the disease was gradually taking its toll on my husband. His physical strength had deteriorated to the point where he could no longer go out. Or even take the long-awaited walks. Even daily tasks became difficult, and he began to doze off and fall asleep more frequently. The doctor came to see him every day, but the only relief was that he was no longer in pain, and I couldn't believe that this was natural and that he would leave me so soon. I nursed my husband, never leaving his side for a second, so he wouldn't be alone when he awoke. Which could happen at any time. Sometimes he'd wake up and tell me the rest of the dream he just awoke from, and other times he'd tell me about long ago memories, as if they just happened. I loved every moment, and this love exacerbated my sadness. My husband gradually stopped waking up after that. When we stopped talking, I stayed by his side. Reading his favorite books and telling him about the sights and sounds I'd missed, so he could understand. I wanted to tell him about a beautiful sunset one day, so I held his hand and tried to speak to him. My husband's hand was cold to the touch. He was barely breathing, and his chest moved in an unnatural way. I panicked and called the doctor, who said he would be there right away. 
I waited for him, feeling as if my heart was being ripped out of my chest by the out of control situation. I hoped it was a misunderstanding. I wanted him to reassure me that everything would be fine. However, when the doctor arrived, he took a look and said, "His blood pressure has already dropped quite a bit. Let him go in peace." I believe he wants you to stay with him, so I'll sit this one out. Don't worry, I'll be right there if anything happens. So please stay by his side. The doctor then said goodbye to my husband and walked out. So the time has come. I knew we would come, but it was unbearable. I was delighted to have met you. There were some challenges, but the truth is that I adore you. I held my husband's hand and whispered in his ear. Then my husband gently squeezed my hand back. It was medically impossible, but I clearly felt it. Soon after, he took his last breath and died quietly. I couldn't stop crying, but I was glad to have been there for him at the end. I was so busy after he had died that I didn't have time to mourn until after the burial. When I finally got home after cleaning up my husband's belongings, I noticed that mail had accumulated like a mountain. I was struck by the nostalgic handwriting I discovered as I went through them one by one. My husband had written dozens of letters. I wondered how long it had been since I had spent every day with him, trying to keep as close to him as possible. His letters started on the day of our reunion. My husband had moved here in the hope of seeing me again, but he didn't expect to actually find me here. It was difficult for him not to notice how surprised and delighted he was. It read, "I couldn't stop laughing at how funny my husband's letters were, and the fact that my husband felt that way was the best compliment he could have given me." The date on the letter indicated that he had been posting it every day. But his handwriting became more dirty, and the length of the letter became shorter as the days passed, clearly demonstrating the progression of his illness. With sadness, I continued reading, but my eyes stopped at one point. He had written the truth about our divorce. My husband's illness started during our marriage. When he discovered it, there was nothing they could do to help him. And the treatment he received as his last hope was ineffective and only had side effects. My husband made plans to divorce me because he didn't want me to spend the rest of my life with this disease, and I fell right into his trap. He had no idea I'd suspect the existence of another woman, but he didn't deny it because he thought he could give a lot of money to me as compensation. Because I no longer required medical treatment, I wanted to liquidate all of my assets so that you could live freely. He wrote, "What hurtful words I'd hurled at my husband, who had thought that far from me." I sincerely apologized. Tears flowed uncontrollably. Then there was a knock on the front door. I wiped my tears quickly and opened the door to find my doctor standing there. What brings you here, doctor? I inquired. When I asked, he handed me a sealed envelope. The envelope was identical to the one I had just read from my husband. He asked me to post it every day. He wrote a few days' worth of letters before he fell into a coma, and he entrusted them to me. I couldn't refuse, and this is the last letter. He asked me to give it to you when you return to your home. So that's what this was about. This was my husband's final letter. I thanked the doctor and read my husband's letter alone. When I opened it quietly and calmly, I found a thin but clear note that said, "Thank you. I love you. We had come so far, but our hearts remain connected. I love you too." When I said this. I thought that I saw my husband's portrait's mouth smile a little. I am still living on this island, decades after my husband died. I am now officially recognized as an island resident. 
I built a grave next to where my husband's house used to stand. The day I was sure I'd never leave the island. My husband used to look out the window every day, and I'm sure he still does. I intend to join him there one day, and I am at peace and very happy to be surrounded by memories of my husband. Thank you for sticking with me until the end. I'll see you in the next video. It is time for dinner at my in-laws' house. My sister-in-law, who had been away for some time, had finally returned home and joined us at the table that night. The food was set out in front of us, and I watched as my mother-in-law, father-in-law, and sister-in-law picked up their utensils and enjoyed the meal. Then my sister stopped and stared at me. "Aren't you going to eat anything?" she asked, and without hesitation I responded, "No, I'm the wife. The leftovers will be sufficient for me. Isn't that correct, mother-in-law?" My sister-in-law was in disbelief. Her mother was more concerned with the food than what I was saying. My sister-in-law had come to view her mother with hatred. My name is Kate. I'm a stay-at-home mom who juggles a part-time job, managing the house, and raising my child. My husband is frequently away on business trips, so I am left to manage things alone. Of course, I can't complain. We're in love, and he earns enough money to keep the house in good condition. My main concern has always been my mother-in-law, who lives within walking distance. She often calls me over insignificant things. The laundry's piled up, so come and wash it for me. She'd say. In the garden, grass has sprouted. In front of the station, there's a new cake shop. She constantly requests that I run errands for her. It's only natural to need help at times. I could forgive her if she did these things once in a while, but it has become multiple times in a day. Honestly, it's been nothing more than a nuisance. I wouldn't mind assisting my mother-in-law if she had a health problem or some other reason that would prevent her from doing these things on her own. However, my mother-in-law is in perfect health, save for her obesity, but she hasn't reported her weight having an effect on her ability to function normally. At my in-laws' house, I am treated as though I am a maid. My father-in-law, unlike his wife, adores me. However, he is completely unaware of the way that she treats me. My mother-in-law only calls me when he's out of the house. When I let my husband know about this, he he claimed that he would talk to his mother about it, and he has. He's warned her time and time again, but she, on the other hand, would make a fuss about it. She would say, "Well, Kate promised that she would help me, but when I asked her to, she changed her mind." Instead of expressing regret, she would cry and claim that I hated her, and that she was the real victim. After several times of going through the same thing, I felt awkward bothering my husband with it any more. I knew that he was so hard at work, and I felt guilt in asking him to help me repeatedly. Eventually, I stopped asking him. Perhaps this is what my mother-in-law wanted, but either way, I was now in a place where I couldn't talk to anyone about what I was going through. And I spent my days alone dealing with her. As of late, her demands of me have increased. One morning, I was made to clean up my in-law's garden. She instructed me to cut branches from the trees in the yard and gather them all up. It was exhausting work, especially as the sun creeped higher into the sky. I was sweating, but I couldn't stop to drink. By the time that I was able to take a break. I went inside the house to find that it was past noon. My mother-in-law was laying on the sofa in the living room. She was completely relaxed, watching TV and eating chocolates. Her T-shirt was covered in wrappers. I'm hungry. 
make something for me from whatever's in the fridge. My mother-in-law ordered me, not taking her eyes off the television. I sighed. As I walked into the kitchen, I laid eyes on the mountain of dishes that had piled up in the sink. You'd better get started. My friends are coming over tonight, and I want the whole place to be absolutely spotless. There's no time to dither. She continues as she devours more sweets. I asked her to assist me, even just a little, but she didn't care to respond. When she was uncomfortable with what I said, she would pretend as though I was not even there. Soon enough, I cleaned up the dishes and prepared fried rice for the both of us to eat. I set the table for the meal and placed both plates onto it. Fried rice. Again. Can't you think up anything else? Even though she complained, she began to eat her meal with gusto. I too was starving. But I was hoping that my husband had messaged me, and I checked my phone before eating. By the time that I had put my phone back down, I was shocked to discover that the plate I had placed in front of me had vanished. My mother-in-law was devouring my meal. She had already finished her own. That is my food, ma'am, I said aloud. By this point, however, my mother-in-law had already consumed more than half of it. I'm still hungry. It's your fault that you only cooked a small amount of food. You're just the wife, after all. You'd think that you'd make more, considering you know the wife eats after the rest of the family's finished. But no, you don't even comprehend that. My mother-in-law quickly devoured the remaining fried rice without waiting for me to respond. There was nothing left. No rice, no vegetables, no meat. Nothing at all. Now, start cleaning up, my mother-in-law said. My friends will be here soon. With that... She got up and marched back to the sofa. With a loud tear, I heard her open a bag of chips, spilling pale yellow crumbs onto the rug beneath her. I vacuumed the floor silently. As I'm watching the machine suck up the potato chip crumbs, I can't help but imagine the vacuum cleaner as my mother-in-law, sucking up every bit of food and every last ounce of my dignity into a cyclone until nothing is left behind. I tried my best to relieve my hunger with water as I cleaned up as I had been asked. But the thought was clear in my mind. I swore to myself that I would never help my mother-in-law again. No matter how much she would beg and plead, I would never assist her again. If she wanted a maid who she could tell what to do, to the point of commanding her not to eat, she could try and pay for one. As for me, I couldn't do it any longer. I would not return to help her. Or so I thought. Things changed dramatically soon after that day. My father-in-law had passed out at work, and in order for him to recover, he needed nursing care. Unlike his wife, my father-in-law had always been a thoughtful and caring man. From the time I was introduced to him all those years ago until now, he'd always been kind to me. I had assumed that you were going to provide us with a grandson. I was foolish to think that you would give us an heir. Absolutely foolish. When I was pregnant with my first child, my mother-in-law would say these things to me. But my father-in-law would chastise her. He silenced her when she complained about our living situation while we were building our own home. He was always concerned about how I was doing, and always offered his skills and advice to us when we needed it. When I learned that my father-in-law had fallen ill, I knew I had to act. I put on my coat, and I was determined to offer the same care in return. But the phone rang. It was my mother-in-law. You wicked wife! When were you going to show up and help me care for my husband? Don't you care at all? How ungrateful. I tried to tell her that I was on my way there, and that I was going to go even if she hadn't asked me. I could hear her start to continue her yelling, but I hung up the phone. I was already worried enough about what my future would look like. 
If taking care of my father-in-law meant bearing this burden a bit longer, I would do it, I thought. I went to my in-law's house to assist with his care. As expected, my mother-in-law didn't seem to take his care very seriously. After his flare-up at work, my father-in-law had become partially paralyzed on his right side. He's maintained some of his autonomy and can use the bathroom on his own, but he required assistance with meals and bathing. Since this meant he needed care throughout the day, I would drop my child off at daycare and go straight to my in-law's house. I make breakfast for my father-in-law, wash his sheets and bedclothes as needed, and so on. I then tidy the house and prepare lunch. It was difficult work, but knowing that it was for my father-in-law, it became much easier. Even still, my mother-in-law would not resist. She insisted on criticizing everything that I was doing. She would make a fuss into my ear while I was preparing food for my father-in-law. This is something for sick people to eat. Can't you bother making something more regular? This food isn't for you. I'm making it for dad, I told her. You're in good health, and you could make your own food. As I said previous, I'm only here for my father-in-law's benefit. And beyond that, I'm here because you will not take care of him. I believe that you're able to take care of yourself at the very least. How? How rude! Do I need to remind you that I have the right to leave this house whenever I want? I don't care what happens to him. That all will be your problem if I leave. Make. Me. Dinner. Her rage bore into me, and mine was swelling in my chest, but she was right. I couldn't risk forcing her to leave. Every care facility in the area was completely full. Even the wait lists were long. As things were, I couldn't be the sole carer for my father-in-law full-time either. Despite my resentment, and desire to rebel against this woman, I had no choice but to submit and make food for her. She devoured it instantly. Oh, I'm so full, she exclaimed. Here are your leftovers to eat. My mother-in-law slowly laid down on the low sofa, leaving me to eat. My gaze moved to the pan, inside which there were only a few pieces of cabbage and a handful of noodles. Not enough to feed an adult. Not enough to feed a child. It was pitiful, but I didn't want to waste the food, so I ate it on a small plate, as though it would make the food appear larger. Of course, it was completely insufficient. I ended up eating a sandwich I had brought from home before I finished folding the laundry and made my way to my father-in-law. I noticed that his face was red. Eyes wet with heavy tears. I'm so sorry, my father-in-law said. He must have overheard what happened in the kitchen. I asked him to be sure. My poor father-in-law. He nodded his head yes, and the shame in his expression was too much to bear. It's because I've become so ill, he said. That's why she's treating you so poorly. No, no. I softly assured him. Please, you've been very good to me. Treated me as though I were your own. I could never see you as a burden now. And you're not to blame for any of this. He nodded again in response, thanking me. I felt sorry for him when I saw him like that. That very night, I received a phone call from my husband's sister. I'd only met her a few times before. My sister-in-law lives with her husband in another state. She and my mother-in-law don't get along well, so she doesn't visit very often. I'm sorry, Kate, for all the trouble. I should go home to my parents' house right away, so that I can be the one taking care of my father, she explained. It had appeared that she had heard about my father-in-law's condition, and that she called me once she discovered I was the one taking care of him. On the other end of the phone, she apologized profusely. 
I told her that I was merely doing what her father would have done for me, and that I hoped she didn't mind. However, my sister-in-law seemed concerned with something else. My mother, she can be... She began. You've had quite a rough time there today, haven't you, Kate? My sister-in-law, like my father-in-law, is wise. She likely knows that my relationship with my mother-in-law has been strained since I've been spending more time taking care of him. I really do appreciate her concern. Though, it makes me wonder. My father-in-law, my sister-in-law, and my husband. They are all such kind people. Why is my mother-in-law so cruel? I couldn't help but become curious. Yes, I'm fine for the time being, though. I let the conversation drift, but my sister-in-law seemed to sense the pain in my voice. After a few moments of silence, she said, I'll be returning home at the end of the year. I'll let my parents know, so you don't have to worry about it any longer, Kate. To be honest, I was exhausted. Housework? Childcare, part-time work, and caring for my father-in-law every day. It was enough as it was. But also preparing food and cleaning for my mother-in-law? Listening to her words, full of hate and disappointment? I was feeling trapped. If something hadn't happened soon, it would have broken completely. So my sister-in-law's words were very reassuring to me. Until then, though... My mother-in-law remained the same. No, in fact, she was getting worse. As the end of the year approached, she would tell me to clean the kitchen, exhaust fan, wash the screen door, and complete other bothersome tasks. She never took into consideration that I had my own house to tend to as well. It was like my life outside of her didn't exist. I wouldn't have time to prepare a dinner for us all on New Year's Eve with my cramped schedule, so I spoke with my husband and we decided to order it online. What a waste of money, I thought. If you're going to be someone's wife, you ought to know how to at least make food. What are you good for? Of course, my mother-in-law was not pleased. You're a wife too, I wanted to scream at her. But I couldn't. I didn't want my father-in-law to overhear us arguing. I didn't want him to think that this was all his fault. I managed to calm her down by promising to prepare the New Year's Eve meal myself. My sister-in-law arrived at the house on New Year's Eve. She was alone. Oh, <laughs> it's your first time home in years, and still you have nothing to show for it. You're all alone now. Whatever happened to that pathetic husband of yours? Did he divorce you for taking his place as man of the house? My mother-in-law hurls insults at her daughter without even saying hello. But when I saw my sister-in-law, I felt that familiar presence. It was as though I was looking at my own reflection as I saw her calmly respond. I couldn't bring my beloved husband here with me. I couldn't bear you being as cruel to him as I knew you would be. Anyways, I came home to see my father, not you. After saying this, my sister-in-law quickly departed into my father-in-law's room. At this rate, the New Year's dinner was not going to go very well. I had made a few dishes, but by dinner time... Those dishes were more lively and pleasant than the people present to eat them. The only sound that I could hear in the quiet living room was a pot simmering softly. I served my father-in-law some food. My mother-in-law began to greedily eat the boiled meat on her plate as if on cue. My sister-in-law only looked on coldly. My husband had been attending his company's end-of-the-year party and he wasn't with us on that night. Had he been there, the atmosphere might have become tolerable or even upbeat. He always brought that to every room he entered. 
I was wishing for this, as I hopelessly assisted my father-in-law the best that I could. Kate, why aren't you eating? My sister-in-law turned to me. I was seated at the table, yes, but only for my father-in-law. There were no plates or utensils available for me. She must have been perplexed, but this had been my life for some time now. I smiled through my pain and told her, Don't worry, I am the wife after all. A wife must be content to have the leftovers once the family's finished. My mother-in-law nods to my sorrowful words. My stomach aches. Right you are, she said, her words muffled by the food that she was actively eating. She was preoccupied with the meat and was thoroughly uninterested in conversing with us. I was curious how she could act like this and still have no shame. Disgusted by her attitude, I made a sarcastic remark. Though, you are a wife as well. Why are you eating now? The family's not yet finished. Before my mother-in-law could react, I was surprised to see my sister-in-law stand. Mama will need to eat a lot of meat while she still can. She won't be able to eat such expensive food if she's kicked out of the house. My eyes widened. My sister-in-law presented his document. A single packet of papers that would change everything. They were divorce papers. My father-in-law appeared to be in on all of this, as I watched the two of them make eye contact. At last, my mother-in-law's hands came to a halt. Father's divorcing you because he's finally run out of patience. He's been accepted into a very nice care facility and is planning on selling this house as soon as he's moved in. My mother-in-law nearly spat out her dinner. She hurriedly swallowed her mouthful and looked at her husband and daughter. If you dare do something like that, you'll have hell to pay in alimony. Her face was turning red as she yelled her threat. I'm afraid that's not going to be an issue. If you insist, though, we can take you to court over it. We have ample evidence of your disregard for the needs of the family and the neglect of your husband. My mother-in-law was enraged, but when the word court was mentioned, her attitude swiftly changed. I'm sure she's well aware what her disadvantage would be if things came to that. I'm sorry for everything. It was as though she was a different person. She whimpered and kneeled on the spot, begging for forgiveness. My sister and father-in-law, on the other hand, had nothing to say to her pitiful display. She kept apologizing, but there was nothing that she could do. All of us in that room knew that she was in the wrong. You'd better get started signing these papers. Once you're done, you can pack your things and leave the house. My sister-in-law was relentless. The years of abuse had welled up within her, and she would not back down on her demands. My mother-in-law would be packed and gone, leaving her alone in the freezing New Year's weather. It had seemed that my mother-in-law was also abusing my father-in-law on a daily basis. She would berate him, telling him that he was worthless, and that she wished that he would have just passed away instead of becoming such a burden. My father-in-law was very smart. He kept track of her daily outbursts and organized them with the help of my sister-in-law. The data that they had both accumulated was crucial in fighting their case in court. By the end, the claim was settled by offsetting it with a share of property leaving my mother-in-law homeless. She currently lives in a rundown apartment and is working part-time to get by. She has become a different person in her struggle. She hasn't been able to afford many nice foods and has lost much of her weight. But she is even less healthy now than before. My father-in-law now spends his days living in a luxury nursing home run by a friend of my sister-in-law. They see to it that he is not only healthy every day, but happy, too. He's made friends with many of the other residents. I pay him visits at least once a week. His progress has been astonishing. Thanks to his rehabilitation, he's regained more movement in the right side of his body. He smiles more frequently, laughs more. It's wonderful. I have made a friend, too, 
My sister-in-law and I have become close, and we communicate often. We both want, more than anything, to keep supporting my father-in-law as best as we can. We will treasure the peace that has finally come to us. Here's a celebration gift, $2,000. After giving birth and returning to my husband's family home, my mother-in-law handed us an envelope with $2,000 as a baby gift. I checked the contents and then threw the envelope into the trash. Was this their payback for enduring days of being belittled by my mother-in-law and senior employees? What are you doing? Apologize to mom, I scolded my flustered husband. Can you say the same after seeing this? My husband, after checking the envelope's contents, glared at his mother with anger he had never shown before. And then he made a decision. My name is Scarlett Wood, 28 years old. I had an arranged marriage with my husband, Elijah. Elijah, two years older than me, is the eldest son of a Japanese sweets shop and was raised strictly as the heir, but he is a very gentle and kind person. From the moment we first met, I was drawn to his kindness. I want people around the world to know the beauty and delicate taste of Japanese sweets. So I work as a Japanese sweets artisan. Will you help make my dream come true? Elijah said this and presented me with a Japanese sweet made in my image instead of an engagement ring. As I was moved to tears, Elijah continued to speak. When we get married, Scarlet, you'll work as the young mistress of our shop. Also, we'll live with my parents in our family home. Is that okay? Living with my in-laws was a condition of the marriage. There's a lot that comes with marrying an heir. But as long as Elijah is with me, everything will be fine. Thinking this way, I accepted his proposal. We became husband and wife. As promised, after the marriage, we started living with my in-laws in the residence that also served as the Japanese sweets shop. Scarlet, you married into this family, so of course you should be prepared. Behave properly as the young mistress. I yes. The day I stepped into my husband's family home, I was already met with harsh words from my mother-in-law. The sweet married life I had dreamt of didn't exist in this world. Scarlet, how many times do I have to tell you? Learn our traditions properly. Please be more aware that you're the young mistress and act accordingly. It's so hard on our headmistress to have someone like you marry into our family. I faced daily criticism from my mother-in-law and senior female employees. My father-in-law didn't speak much, but when he was watching me, I felt tense and would sometimes make mistakes because of it. He would sigh loudly seeing my performance. There was no place for me to feel at ease in this house. But I was determined to work hard, earn everyone's approval, and become a wife Elijah wouldn't be ashamed of. That feeling alone kept me going. During this time, I found out I was pregnant. Take care of yourself and give birth to a fine heir. Everyone, starting with my mother-in-law, began to be more considerate of my condition. At the five-month pregnancy checkup, I learned the baby's gender and excitedly shared the news during dinner with my in-laws and Elijah. Our baby is a girl. For a moment, everyone froze. A girl? Oh, a girl. Huh. Wait, no one is offering congratulations. Elijah kept his gaze down, silently continuing to eat without making eye contact with anyone. I was taken aback by everyone's attitude. Does an heir have to be a boy? Unable to understand the Mr. Wood family's mindset, I ate my meal in frustration. The next day, everyone's attitude changed completely. Pregnancy isn't an illness. Stop being spoiled and work hard. As soon as they found out the baby was a girl, 
the criticism and mistreatment from my mother-in-law and senior employees returned. Why can't a girl inherit the Japanese sweets shop? I felt sorry for my unborn child, who wouldn't be welcomed into the world with smiles and blessings. I made up my mind to protect her, no matter what. I think you've noticed, Elijah. I've been criticized every day since I married into this family. The way they treat me since they found out our child is a girl is unbearable. One day, I couldn't take it anymore and told Elijah. He looked troubled. Scarlet, I'm sorry. I'm still in training. I don't have the right to oppose this family. Please bear with it. If you learn your job quickly, I'm sure my mother and others will stop criticizing you. I'm very happy whether our child is a boy or a girl. Please take care of yourself. With that, Elijah quickly went to take a bath. Though he tried to be considerate, I was shocked by how unreliable Elijah was. But I rubbed my belly. I can't let this get me down. I'm going to be a mother. I must become strong for that reason. With that in mind, I endured the mistreatment and criticism alone, dreaming of the day my child would be born healthy. In my in-law's home, I was mainly responsible for cooking dinner. When buying groceries, I'd pay for them first, then give the receipt to my mother-in-law, who would reimburse me. This system made it difficult to buy what I wanted since she checked the receipts meticulously. Because of this system and my mother-in-law's thorough examination of the receipts, it was hard for me to buy things I really wanted to eat. However, after becoming pregnant, I often found myself craving sour and sweet foods. Mmm, should I buy it? <sighs> but I don't want my mother-in-law to make snide remarks again. I debated while shopping, but never found the courage to buy anything. One day, though, I desperately wanted something sweet. Feeling helpless, I agonized over it before finally asking Elijah who was working in the shop. Oh, I can't help but crave sweets because of the pregnancy. Can I have some scraps or something if there are any? Sure, just wait a moment. Elijah secretly wrapped up some leftover scraps from making the sweets in plastic wrap, avoiding the eyes of the employees. Thank you. But just then, my mother-in-law appeared. What are you doing here, Scarlet? My mother-in-law's gaze falls on my hand. Well, how shameless. This is the workshop for the artisans. I won't allow you to come in here anymore. Saying this, she snatches the scraps Elijah had given me and kicks me out of the workshop. One day, as I open the fridge to prepare dinner, I find it packed with high-end ingredients like luxurious Wagyu beef that I've never seen before. Since I can't use the fridge's contents without my mother-in-law's permission, I ask her for confirmation. Can I use the food in the fridge? What are you talking about? That's for Natalie. Who's coming back the day after tomorrow? Don't you dare use it. She coldly responds. Natalie is Elijah's sister. She married into a farming family and now, three months pregnant and suffering from morning sickness, she's apparently coming back to her parents' house. Returning home just three months into her pregnancy. I'm seven months pregnant and I've been used and abused being told pregnancy isn't an illness. I have a lot on my mind, but the more I think about it, the more miserable I become. So I pull myself together and prepare dinner using the other ingredients. On the day Natalie returns home, my mother-in-law is in high spirits from mourning. She had originally opposed Natalie marrying into the farming family and seems overjoyed to have her back home after a long time. I'll cook dinner today, Scarlet, so you can go and take a leisurely walk. Unusually, my mother-in-law is kind. Usually, I'm busy in the evenings and can't take leisurely walks, so I decide to take advantage of her offer. Ah, the sky is so high. The sky I look up at after a long time is dyed red and it warmly envelops me. When I suddenly touch my belly, I feel the baby move. Mommy will work hard for you, so come out healthy and strong.
I whispered to my unborn child, Oh, what a delicious smell. When I return home, I'm greeted by the aroma of grilled steak. As I try to enter the living room, I hear voices from the inside. Natalie, eat a lot for the sake of your baby. Peeking inside, I see my mother-in-law has lined up a variety of dishes in front of Natalie. At the table, my father-in-law and Elijah are silently eating steak. What about Scarlett's portion? The moment Elijah says this and looks up, our eyes meet. Oh, don't worry. I made some stew for her. At my mother-in-law's reply, Elijah says nothing and looks away from me. There's no steak for me. I can't take it anymore and quietly go to our bedroom, trying not to draw attention. I'm pregnant, just like Natalie, yet no one tells me to eat a lot. Seeing the reality that I'm being excluded, I can't hold back my tears any longer. Why do I have to suffer like this? Neither my unborn child nor I are welcomed in this house. I just want to leave this place. My tears keep flowing endlessly. After a while, Elijah comes in with a cold piece of steak. I secretly brought you my portion. It's cold, but I'm sorry for making you feel even sadder with my sister here. He genuinely apologizes, looking remorseful. I should be more assertive, but I'm not good with my mom and sister. My mom struggled with my grandma, so she probably thinks this is normal for a mother-in-law and daughter-in-law relationship. My sister didn't like me since I was little because I was the eldest son and got a lot of attention. And she's always been mean to me behind my back. They're both strong-willed and troublesome. So honestly, I don't want to deal with them. Your family issues have nothing to do with me. Although he apologized, I realize he won't particularly protect me or our child in the future. Feeling even more miserable due to Elijah's unreliability, I eat the steak he offers, though I have no appetite, thinking of the baby in my belly. Even though it's supposed to be high-quality meat, I can't taste it. I mechanically chew and somehow manage to swallow it. Life after Natalie's return is even harder for pregnant me. Scarlet, please fetch this for me. My mother-in-law doesn't hesitate to make me work, despite my big belly. Natalie, you should rest until your morning sickness subsides. Meanwhile, Natalie takes advantage of being pampered by her parents and lounges around the house all day. We're both pregnant, but even though my belly is much bigger, ugh. It's frustrating, but for now, I have to quietly endure it. Scarlet, I brought some pudding for you. The fact that Elijah started secretly buying me food I wanted to eat because he must have felt sorry for the unbearable treatment I was receiving was at least a small comfort. One day, I happened to see that Natalie's room was filled with high-end branded baby products and maternity items. I had held back and bought everything at a cheap store on the outskirts of town. Both our children would be grandchildren to my in-laws, so why is there such a difference? Ugh. I tried not to care, but it made me very sad. On December 20th, I finally gave birth to a baby girl. Elijah cried tears of joy. I'll grow up quickly and protect both you and our child. Elijah made this promise to me. When we returned to my in-law's house after being discharged from the hospital, my mother-in-law surprisingly welcomed us with a smile. Let me hold her for a bit. I handed the baby to my mother-in-law, and as expected, she was skilled at soothing the baby since she had raised two children herself. I guess she loves her grandchild after all. I felt a little relieved seeing my mother-in-law's demeanor. After a while, she returned the baby to me and took an envelope out of her pocket to give to Elijah. Here's a gift. Two thousand dollars. What? That much? I was surprised, but Elijah didn't seem too shocked. Maybe in this family it's normal to give that much as a gift. Elijah handed the envelope to me without checking the contents, so I put the baby in the crib before accepting it. I checked the contents, just in case. What? What is this? 
My mother-in-law looked away, smirking. Enough already. I threw the envelope into the trash. Hey, what are you doing? Apologize to my mom. Elijah panicked. Would you say the same thing if you saw this? I picked up the discarded envelope and showed Elijah the contents. Upon seeing it, Elijah furrowed his brows. Unbelievably, instead of $2,000, the envelope contained a bundle of receipts and invoices for luxury food and maternity items that my in-laws had prepared for Natalie. What's the meaning of this, Mom? Even Elijah raised his voice. It's only natural for the eldest son's family to pay for our household expenses. My mother-in-law shamelessly spouted nonsense. Why should we have to pay for the maternity items and baby gear meant for Natalie, who had married into our family? I can't stay silent any longer. I made up my mind to leave this house with my child. At that moment, Elijah's low voice echoed, I'm leaving this house. What? The room went quiet, and everyone, including me, looked at Elijah. Elijah glared at his mother with a rage I'd never seen before. What do you think we are? Your attitude towards Scarlet, how you acted when you found out our child is a girl, and how you always interfere with the store I was put in charge of. I've always been unhappy with it, but as the eldest son of this confectionery shop, I thought I'd endure it until I became a capable person to protect the shop. However, I've reached my limit. Our family is leaving this house. I won't take over the shop. Thank you for everything, Elijah said and deeply bowed to his parents. My in-laws were speechless at the unexpected turn of events and eventually left the room silently. Scarlet, I'm truly sorry for everything, I'll protect you and our child. I decided to leave this house on my own. But will you stay by my side? Elijah's face returned to its usual gentle expression. Yes, thank you for protecting us. Let's overcome any difficulties together as a family of three. From the next day, Elijah started looking for a new home. And a week later, our new life as a family of three began. Our new home was a small 2DK apartment but it was very happy and a comforting space for me. Make sure you eat a lot and sleep well when you can. And to my surprise, our new home was only a five-minute walk from my parents' house. Elijah is really a wonderful person. It's rare for someone to admit their weakness and ask for help as an adult. According to my mother, had explained and apologized for everything to my parents the night he decided to leave, asking for their help moving forward. You can always rely on us. We're so happy that you're close by. I cried at my mother's kindness. Elijah occasionally gets messages from his mother asking to show their grandchild, but he seems to only send pictures. After discussing as a couple, we decided that our family and his parents should keep a distance for a while, and we never told them our new address. Thanks to that, we were able to live peaceful days. Scarlet, we're running out of diapers. I'll go buy some. Elijah actively helped with housework and childcare, and we cherished our modest happiness, living humbly every day. I'm thinking of starting my own business. One day, Elijah came to me for advice. Even though the path to inherit his family's business had been closed off, Elijah, who had been fascinated by traditional Japanese sweets since he was a child, had not given up on being involved with them. His dream of sharing the beauty and delicate taste of Japanese sweets with people all over the world, which he had shared with me before we got married, was still alive in his heart. To make that dream come true, Elijah decided to start an online store for Japanese sweets. I was inspired by him. I wanted to help him achieve his dream too. With that thought in mind, I wondered if I could utilize the experience I had gained while briefly involved in making Japanese sweets at my in-laws' house, and I brainstormed in between housework and childcare. Look at the beautiful Japanese sweets Papa made! One day, showed our child the Japanese sweets he had made. 
although our zero-year-old child couldn't eat them yet, their eyes sparkled and they laughed excitedly at the sight of gentle colors unique to Japanese sweets. Seeing that, I had a flash of inspiration. What about Japanese sweets that even babies can eat? In my head, I pictured cute baby smiles and Japanese sweets overlapping. As soon as I told Elijah, he agreed, saying, That's a great idea, and incorporated my suggestion. We focused on developing Japanese sweets that utilize the natural sweetness of ingredients like sweet potatoes instead of sugar and the gentle colors of the ingredients themselves without using food coloring, all while making them suitable for babies. And in about three months, we created the product we had envisioned. At first, we placed our sweets in a friend's Japanese sweet shop and observed the customers' reactions. The feedback was better than we could have ever imagined, with comments saying they were perfect for first meals and birthday parties. This could work! With that thought, we started selling our sweets online, and they became a huge hit in no time. The media picked up our story, and our company steadily grew. Until the business took off, Elijah and I were fully occupied with childcare and work. However, by the time our daughter turned two, the company had stabilized and was generating a steady income. As we gained some breathing room, I suddenly thought of Elijah's family, with whom we hadn't spoken for almost two years. In fact, after we left, I heard that Natalie developed preeclampsia during her pregnancy and had to be hospitalized. Perhaps it wasn't good for her to eat high-calorie food and expensive meat from her in-laws without exercising much. She had to endure a restricted pregnancy with strict bed rest and dietary restrictions. Well, everyone must have been relieved when a healthy baby boy was born. Unfortunately, the bad news continued as the family's Japanese sweets shop went out of business after Elijah left. What happened to your parents after they closed the shop? When I asked Elijah, he said they were living modestly on their pension. Despite not having many good memories, they were still the people who raised Elijah. Two years had passed since we left his family's home, and our anger had somewhat subsided. So, after discussing with Elijah, we decided to give each of his parents $2,000 in cash as a birthday present. By the way, the amount of $2,000 came from the $2,000 his mother had mentioned as a childbirth gift. We didn't know if she remembered, but if she did, we hoped she would reflect on it. Later, we received a message from Elijah that the money we sent by registered mail had arrived. His parents were apparently very happy. Although we weren't ready to visit his family's home yet, we believed time would resolve this issue. As long as we live our lives with pride, things should move in a positive direction. Childcare is still a challenge, but with the support of my parents, I can focus on Japanese sweets with Elijah. Mom, is this my candy? Yes, Cherry. The cherry blossom petals are beautiful, aren't they? Tasty? Delicious. I'm so happy. My daughter touches her cheek with a delighted expression. This is a Japanese sweet we developed to be edible even for one-year-olds, melting in their mouths without needing to be chewed. We made it into a cute Japanese sweet shaped like cherry blossom petals inspired by our daughter's name, Cherry. I hope this sweet, like our child, brings smiles to everyone's faces. Mom, here, open wide. My daughter feeds me a piece of the sweet. The gentle sweetness melts in my mouth. I love that face, Mom. I hope this blissful moment with Japanese sweets reaches people all around the world. I, Lisa, tied the knot last year with Harry, my boyfriend of three years. We first met on social media. It all began when Harry, a friend of a friend, liked a photo of me and started following me. He's two years younger and works as a software engineer. Though he's in tech, he's also a great communicator and seemed to be recognized as a rising star at his company. On our second anniversary, Harry proposed. It was a truly simple proposal. 
at our favorite local Italian restaurant, just before dessert, he began. I have something to say. Curious, I waited, and then he said, Will you marry me? Presenting a ring. It was a straightforward proposal, but it deeply moved me. Of course, I immediately replied, Yes, I'd love to! Later, I learned from Harry that before we even started dating, during a casual drink with friends, the topic of ideal proposals came up. I had mentioned wanting something simple, and he remembered it all along. Afterwards, we held our engagement party at a hotel in New York. That's when I first met Harry's family. He has his parents and an older sister, who's six years his senior and was also planning to get married soon. Harry, standing at 5'6", is on the shorter side for a guy. His entire family is also quite petite. On the other hand, I'm tall for a woman at 5'5". Five five. My mom, a former model, is even an inch taller than me. And my dad stands tall at 5'10". I couldn't help but feel a bit concerned about our height differences. I've always been attracted to shorter guys, usually around 5'3". Conversely, Harry has a thing for taller women. So, we were a perfect match in that sense. Our engagement party, however, lacked a certain spark. Later, I found out that Harry's mother and sister had been criticizing my family and me. After that meeting, we got married in August, three months later. Instead of a lavish ceremony, we just wanted a casual, fun gathering with friends. So, we simply held a wedding announcement party. This didn't sit well with Harry's mother and sister. When we visited Harry's family home after the wedding, they openly showed their displeasure. It was summer and I wore a yellow floral sleeveless dress with heeled sandals. They began. Could you not wear something like that to someone's house? I'm so sorry, I'll go change right away. Feeling I'd made a mistake, I rushed home to change. When I returned, Harry's mother criticized the bound cushion cake I brought. Who wants to eat such a thing in this heat? Normally people bring cooler looking, refreshing desserts, don't they? I had chosen the baum cushion because it's delicious when chilled. You really don't think things through. I guess your model mother couldn't teach you better. Just because you have a small face doesn't mean you have a big brain. Looks aren't everything, especially in our family. We value consideration, not like your family that only cares about appearances. I was shocked to hear them speak about my mother and father this way. I looked to Harry for support, but he seemed lost in thought. On our way home, Harry began. About what my mom and sister said earlier? Yeah. I never expected them to act like that. They had made some comments after the engagement party, but I thought they'd come around. I'm really sorry. It's okay. We'll get to know each other better over time. Probably. Yeah, but I never thought they'd be like that. I was naive. Don't worry about it. Accepting someone new into the family can be challenging. At that time, knowing Harry cared was enough for me. I don't want to be taken advantage of by someone else, and I just need to take the time to build a relationship of trust. One day, Harry's sister messaged him, saying she and her husband wanted to visit our home. So, on a Saturday afternoon, they were scheduled to come over. 
I have to work this Saturday. Can you handle them alone? Harry had asked his sister to reschedule, but she insisted on that day. Yeah, I'll take care of everything. And so, on Saturday, Harry's sister and her husband arrived. Please make yourselves at home. We're here to see if you're living properly. After I quickly cleared the tea and cake, my sister-in-law said, All right, let's see your place, and hurried off to the bedroom. To my shock, she started opening my closet without asking. Please don't go through my closet without permission. Why not? I came to see if you're living properly. Who knows? Maybe you just shove everything in there without cleaning. That's not true. Then, she began taking pictures of the closet's contents with her phone. Hey, what are you doing? Don't take pictures without asking. My mom asked me to. She wanted photos. It was so rude. She checked every drawer, even commenting on the color of my underwear, took pictures of the dresser's contents, the bathroom cabinet, and even under the kitchen sink. She meticulously photographed the living room cabinet where we keep our valuables. No matter how many times I asked her to stop, she continued taking pictures throughout the house. In the living room, she noticed our high-end brand TV, a gift from my parents, and remarked with a hint of disdain, You have a pretty nice TV. She then snapped a photo and said to her husband, who had been silently following her, We need to step up our game. That night, after my husband returned from work, I told him everything. I couldn't help but cry a little. We might need to set some boundaries. My dad has been giving me some intel too. Really? Just wait and see. In April, it had been five years since my husband's grandmother passed away. So there was a family gathering. Since we didn't have a wedding, this was my first time meeting my husband's extended family. His family originally moved from Atlanta, and the gathering was held there. Of course, most of the relatives live in Atlanta. The gathering was overwhelming. There were so many relatives and it was hard to remember everyone. My mother-in-law, probably on purpose, didn't introduce me to anyone. I asked my husband to introduce me. However, everyone seemed to sense the tension and their reactions were lukewarm at best. My sister-in-law, trying to show off, deliberately chatted happily with the relatives in front of me. When I looked lost, she swooped in and said, She's so clueless. All she cares about is her looks. Come on, help out. My mother-in-law joined in, treating me as the clueless daughter-in-law. Time passed and my relationship with my mother-in-law and sister-in-law showed no signs of improving. One day, in early fall, my mother-in-law suggested a family trip. She wanted to go to Boston since the Acela Express passed through there. Everyone agreed, and it was decided that my father-in-law, mother-in-law, sister-in-law, husband, and I would go. My brother-in-law couldn't join due to work. I was looking forward to the trip in September, when the weather was cooler. However, I was worried about being harassed by my mother-in-law and sister-in-law during the trip. But this time, my husband would be with me. I had never been to Boston, so I was excited. We planned to use a long weekend for the trip. On the day while my husband and father-in-law were buying snacks, my mother-in-law suddenly said, Oh no, I think I left my glasses at the cafe we were at earlier. The cafe upstairs? 
Yes. Can you go get them? Uh, which store is that? Isn't there an area on the second floor where there are several stores lined up? It's a self-service cafe over there. But our train is leaving soon, isn't it? That's why I'm asking you to hurry. But... Do you expect me to go through the trip without my glasses? I didn't mean... Just go! Reluctantly, I ran off to find her glasses. There's no way I'd make it back in time for the train. I ran as fast as I could. We've got the snacks. Let's hurry. Let's go. Where's Lisa? She said she needed the restroom and went ahead. All right, let's hurry then. By the time I returned from the cafe on the second floor, having confirmed there were no forgotten glasses, the Osala Express had already departed. I knew it. From the start, my mother-in-law and sister-in-law had planned to leave me behind. On second thoughts, as I was processing this, my mother-in-law called. We've already left, she said, her voice dripping with glee. But I retorted. Yes, I'm aware. Take care. What? What did she say? From the other end, I could hear my sister-in-law. She's acting tough, saying take care or something. Poor thing, left behind and still trying to act strong. Just before the call ended, I overheard my husband and father-in-law saying they were going to the restroom. About 20 minutes later, the Osala Express arrived at New London Station. Where are the guys? They're taking a while. Maybe they stopped for a beer. In reality, my husband and father-in-law had gotten off the train. Unbeknownst to my mother-in-law and sister-in-law, they returned to Metro Park Station, paid for round-trip tickets, and met up with me. Our real destination for this trip was Washington, D.C., my father-in-law had informed me of the scheme my mother-in-law and sister-in-law had planned. He was furious at their constant harassment. He once confronted them, saying, Enough of this nonsense. Lisa is a good person and important to Harry. But they dismissed it. Dad, you're just blinded by her looks. Men are so easily deceived. They didn't even try to listen to their father-in-law's opinion. Their ill intentions continued, and my father-in-law decided a harsh lesson was needed. So, he and my husband hatched a plan to leave them behind instead. On the contrary, my plan is to leave my mother-in-law and sister-in-law behind. Thus, my mother-in-law and sister-in-law were left on the Acela Express, Likely not realizing until they reached Boston. They probably didn't bring much money expecting my father-in-law to cover all expenses. My mother-in-law and sister-in-law were in for a tough time. They had no hotel to stay in. My husband had taken care of the travel arrangements and he had canceled the Boston Hotel reservation the day after booking it. With little cash on hand, my mother-in-law and sister-in-law were definitely in a bind. They won't get it unless we teach them a lesson like this. They're adults. They'll find their way back somehow. My father-in-law, my husband, and I enjoyed some snacks we just bought on the Acela Express heading to Washington. Yes, the two of them going to buy snacks was actually part of our plan. We arrived in Washington before evening. Throughout the journey, there were several messages from my mother-in-law and sister-in-law to my father-in-law and husband, but both of them ignored them completely. The three of us 
thoroughly enjoyed Washington. It's more fun without those two. I was trying not to say that. Both Harry and my father-in-law were in high spirits, making such comments. We had a relaxed trip without cramming too much sightseeing. Meanwhile, the mother-in-law and sister-in-law who were left behind on the Acela Express. They got off at Boston South Station and waited for my father-in-law and husband, but they never showed up. They realized something was off, but it was too late. They frantically messaged my father-in-law and husband, but there was no response since they had decided to ignore them. They finally realized they had been left behind and headed to the hotel. But the hotel reservation had been cancelled the day before. They went to the nearest restaurant and checked how much money they had. Both had relied on my father-in-law's wallet during the trip. So they hardly had any cash and didn't even bring credit cards. Together, they had about $150, just enough for a cheap hotel and a late-night bus ride home. But they couldn't even have a decent meal. They tried to book a bus for that night, but it was already full. So, they reluctantly booked a bus for the next night. For about a day and a half, they couldn't eat properly. They shared a biscuit they bought at the station. They kept messaging my father-in-law and husband, but of course, there was no reply. It seemed like my mother-in-law and sister-in-law no longer had the energy to bother me. For dinner, they bought cereal at a grocery store and ate it in their hotel room. Mom, what's going on? I don't know. Isn't it your father's doing? Who's the mastermind? But this is too much, isn't it? The next day, they went without food or drink and waited until night to board the bus. Apparently, I had a ton of messages and missed calls from them. I had blocked them, so I only noticed later. The next morning, the bus arrived in New York. They slept until the evening. By the time they woke up, my father-in-law, my husband and I had returned from Washington. I went back to our apartment first, and my husband went to his parents' house with his father. We knew from messages that my mother-in-law and sister-in-law had somehow made it back. As soon as they got home, they confronted my father-in-law and husband. My husband and I were on standby, called by my father-in-law. What's the meaning of this? We had very little cash and went through so much. We did it because you two planned to leave Jamie behind. So, Harry and I planned to leave you two behind. But that's cruel. It's her fault. She pointed at me. I wasn't sure how to react, so I just smiled. I am so pissed. Stop smiling. My sister-in-law threw her bottled tea at me, but my father-in-law deflected it with a chop and it hit my mother-in-law's forehead. Ouch! I struggled to hold back my laughter. Haven't you two learned your lesson? My father-in-law shouted. Mom, sis, stop this. It's embarrassing. My husband laughed. What's embarrassing? She's the embarrassing one. Enough. If you keep this up, I'll divorce you. What? Divorce? My mother-in-law turned pale. Sis, mom, just stop, or I'll get really mad. The word divorce completely demoralized my sister-in-law and mother-in-law. It's because of you too that this happened. Just accept it. My mother-in-law and sister-in-law finally broke down in tears. Father, Harry, it seems they're truly remorseful. Please forgive them. I never wanted things to end this way. Please, I beg you. 
I pleaded with my father-in-law and husband. Jamie, we're so sorry. And there, my mother-in-law and sister-in-law vowed never to harass me again and apologize for everything they had done. Thanks to me, talks of divorce and disownment were off the table. Little did they know, this was all part of my plan. The one who seemed the most excited when we hatched this plan was my father-in-law. But that's a secret. Half a year has passed since then. Recently, both my mother-in-law and sister-in-law have started treating me normally. Now, the three of us even go shopping and visit cafes together. I finally felt accepted as a part of the family. Next year, I hope to go on a Boston trip with the entire family. This time, without any hitches.